Welcome to the podcast of the Telos Paul Picon Institute's Israel Initiative. In this episode, Initiative Director Gabrielle Brahm speaks with Carrie Nelson, former president of the American Association of University Professors. Their conversation follows our webinar of January 7th about the role of critical theory in the response within higher education to the Hamas atrocities of October 7th, 2023. Nelson is the author of a new book, Hate Speech and Academic Freedom, The Anti-Semitic Assault on Basic Principles. To support our work, please consider making a contribution to or becoming a member of the Institute. Visit telosinstitute.net. Sponsoring members receive a subscription to the journal Telos. Carrie, we want to talk about your contribution to our investigation of critical theory's role. At Telos, we're interested in critical theory. We want to, invest in, to investigate the role of critical theory before 10.7, on 10.7, after 10.7. You gave a great talk about this uh, not long ago um, on a webinar series. Let's discuss that. And then let's talk about your new book on free speech and hate speech and anti-Semitism. And that should um, be rewarding for any uh, listeners out there. What were you saying, first of all, about the question of critical theory's role, as some people have worried, in softening the ground, in preparing people in some way, that this is a question, for a reception of the rape and torture and murder of Jewish Israelis as if it were a good thing. On American college campuses, there were professors trained in critical theory, probably more than anything, who said they were exhilarated, this is a great thing. Young people on campuses being taught by these folks, according to surveys, I'm laughing because it's so crazy, pro Hamas. We asked you to be the first uh, and foremost to address the question, is it because of postmodernism and critical theory and cultural studies, which you helped, not single-handedly, but you helped to create. Is that the reason that American college campuses are uh, applauding Hamas? And uh, well, I think I think. What do you say? I think that first of all, what is critical theory? What is this? What is this entity, critical theory? And you know, it's it's an invention. I'm not sure. I don't think it exists. I mean, the obvious thing to say is that there are critical theories. There are multiple theories which have been in competition with one another, have been clarifying one another, undermining, reinforcing one another. I mean, if, if you live through the 70s and the, in the 80s, you saw a, um, a field of theories uh, that offered quite different vocabularies, quite different insights, quite different techniques of reading that were in competition with one another. Um, and I, I actually was part of a faculty seminar for 20 years that would typically spend, we would spend a semester studying something or sometimes a year. We spent a year reading and debating about Derrida. Um, about 15 faculty members talking with one another from many different disciplines couple of philosophers, someone from political science, that a couple of people from English, uh, in this setting, working with bodies of theory, we spent a year working on, on contemporary Marxism. Uh, we, we read Lacan for a period of time. So I was in this intellectual environment in which you had to think of this range of theories engaged with and challenging each other. Um, it was, that was the social world here at Illinois that I was very much involved in, as opposed to being committed to only one body of theory. And I think that's so. Th I think that was that was very formative. So this this monolithic entity, critical theory, mm. is an invention. Mm. It's an invention out of ignorance. Mm. Um, there is well no there is no coalescing body of theory consistent with itself 
that has had an intellectual role in the humanities or anywhere else. So we begin with that. So when you see these invocations of critical theory, I think already you're in the domain of ignorance. But that said, um, all intellectual traditions are potentially weapons. They're always double-edged swords. They promote insight and they can promote ignorance. That's 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 how the brain works for this species, at least. I don't estimate what it does for salamanders, but for uh, Homo sapiens. So critical theory is always different. Critical theories have been there as weapons, and some bodies of theory in the immediate wake of the pogrom, the Hamas pogrom, and by the immediate wake, we mean, we mean at most hours, at most it's hours after the assault that people used some the critical traditions to rationalize and augment their own anti-Semitism and their ways of dealing with and promoting the Hamas assault. But, you know, it's only were, part of the, the broad spectrum of theory, you're saying. Right. Well, well, I mean, so they used just, you know, post-colonialist theory has been used for a long time to demonize the Jewish state. Um, and of course, we mount elaborate arguments why that is based on error based on misunderstanding of the history of the Yishuv. I mean, that's, that's, we're struggling over that. Mm. And part of that struggle, for me at least, is to try to extricate post-colonialism from its demonic abuses. Mm. I mean, uh, do I think, do I think it was good for India to throw off the yoke of the British? Yes. Do I think it was worth the United States throwing off the, the yoke of the British? Yes. Um, I and, mean, and the Jews in Palestine. Absolutely. Um, very much the same thing. Um, but that doesn't turn the Jewish settlements into extensions of and vehicles of European power. The Jews are trying to escape. <laughs> Some of them came here. Some of them came from Russia to get away from pogroms and went to Israel. Your family and mine, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you know these arguments. Well, but do, do, does yourself. everybody understand what to, to say but about settler? Uh, weren't these settler colonialisms? There, there are there are particular ways in which they saw themselves as establishing a colony as a colony in which a new Jew could be born and created. But that wasn't the same as uh, a colony in which, um, you know, uh, uh, the czar could have a vehicle uh, in the Levant, right? It was a vision of self-uplift, up, so, self... Um, I don't want to say self-help, but 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 it was a liberation movement of, of the Jews, and yet their detractors say they were colonizers. And you're not. Uh, they sometimes down. use. I mean, yeah. some some use that rhetoric, um, but um, it, it it wasn't. They weren't colonists in the sense that the European powers established their agency mm -hmm. throughout the world, throughout much of the world, uh, certainly in the 19th century and earlier. Um, the model just doesn't work. I've heard some rumors that there were Jews in Palestine for quite a few years before then. So they uh, say. <laughs> every, every now and again, a certain <laughs> artifact is turned up. Uh, Continu continuous presence since time uh, immemorial. And uh, yeah, well, you know, it's funny how so people seem to miss that. It's um, given that given that various theories had so many decades of influence in the humanities and that includes not just sometimes the you know the adoption of french theory in the united states but 
the developments in France that preceded that, that elaborated uh, French theory in the in the sixties. Um, th they were they were central to our intellectual life. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were. I remember. I'm old enough to remember at my age. You were one of them, Jameson, Spivak, uh, I don't know, Lentricia, Hayden White, my teacher. Uh, this stuff was in, in vogue at this and we moment. Were, we, were, we were embattled. It was not. Yeah. It was not the dominant paradigm. No, it became, um, but it wasn't. It took some effort. I, I, I came here in 1970. And I was, for that decade, the 70s, the only person in a very large English department teaching theory. I was the only one. Jeez. Uh, I, I, I discovered early on that some of this wasn't exactly um, workable with my undergraduate audience. I had almost no ah. teaching experience when I came here. Huh. I assigned undergraduates to read Foucault's The Order of Things. Oh, please. And, That's, uh, after know. one session, I told them they could return it to the bookstore. That we Did you read it? Did you read it? For <laughs> <laughs> that semester. Yeah. Um, and I very much wanted to teach in the campus honors program because that was really my constituency. The, the director of the honors program, who was the same person for all of my 30 some years at Illinois, said no undergraduates need to be protected from theory which means they need to be protected from you you can't teach in the honors program um and he maintained that position till he retired um so it was, was he was he wrong was he wrong given uh forgive me for playing devil's advocate just given the way that undergraduates seem to now have received that i don't like his statement because you're a wonderful teacher for undergraduates graduates and i still learn from you you're my teacher to this day but was he wrong carrie let me just um pose you the question to suggest that well, look at how undergraduates seem to have interpreted what they've gotten from theory today, which turns out to be, according to some people, we're going to talk about Chris Rufo's work and uh, Yasha Monk and, and others, back to Ellen Bloom. There's a sense that what undergrads make of it all is some kind of nihilistic, relativistic, and in the, in the end, at the end of the day, anti-Semitic mishmash. Was he wrong? You're... Uh, colleague who thought it wrong to expose you to undergrads as the um i guess the allies uh did with heidegger after the war they they, they said he could continue to write but he shouldn't be <laughs> exposed to undergrads um were you like heidegger in that sense a threat to the youth um i was never a fan of heidegger so i'm, I'm not willing to um <laughs> i'm not willing especially what was eventually made clear about heidegger i'm not willing to say that uh, he would have been the solution for undergraduate uh, uh, limit, limitations of education or intellect. But uh, if there's to be no theory, then undergraduates aren't to be exposed to psychoanalysis. They aren't, they aren't to be allowed to learn that they might have unconscious motivations. They might not understand, be able to understand their relations with their family, um, with their friends without some some knowledge of psychoanalysis, or at least they wouldn't have the intelligibility of self-awareness that was possible through psychoanalytic theory. Just said, just, just, I mean, that would have been included. He wasn't talking just about Derrida. He thought the whole ball of wax was uh, a danger uh, to young minds. And um, maybe it ruined me, but, you know, I'm not really convinced that it did. Um, so I, well, I think it, it, it's it was... crazy, though, when you put it that way, the kids today, they're exposed to this stuff one way or the other. They might as well get it from a reliable source. I mean, you, you really can't protect them from the world of modern and even postmodern thought and just teach them Plato and Aristotle because it's somehow more edifying. I, I might in some moods wish that were so. But but as you say this in our art, should they be protected from at least the new Marxism, in which they see how uh, class is one of the structuring features of American society and has been so since since uh, the day 
Christopher Columbus put his foot on the ground. Uh, I mean, you mean the war criminal? You mean the statues being torn got down guy? I mean, <laughs> listen, well, since I'm you not, mentioned I'm that. I'm not turning him into a hero. I'm just saying that, you know, yeah. class has been a feature of the American landscape since, since, Columbus. since its creation. Since uh, 1619. Is that the, is that the year? Yeah. When did, when did America yeah. start? Well, you know, for some people, that's a good starting point. I always thought it was uh, 1776 or Plymouth Rock, but I've been told now that it's um, slavery. You seem to touch on here a good uh, kind of uh, pivot. I mean, can you can point. you can you understand the formative role that race has had in American society? It's the primarily primary social collective wound mm -hmm. that the country has suffered from for hundreds of years long before it was a state um can you understand that without some theories about race can mm. you can you understand that without theorizing about race i i don't think so or at least you have no business trying to understand it at a university without some theorizing about race that doesn't mean that uh, everything that's happened in an effort to theorize race over the last generation is a good thing. I've written against some of it. I mean, I was... All right, well, let's let's press on that a little bit. A little, little pushback from uh, me here, sitting here, uh, doing uh, my job of um, inviting you to respond. A good thing. Surely it has been not, has not been. <laughs> uh just to pick a, a particular uh, moment in, in these days after 10 7 we we could debate everything from the closing of the american mind forward and um i i, I i'm with you theory is diverse and and it has different uh uses I, and, and by and the uses, way i should but... say that i've i I've, I've been in part as a result of um of the webinar that we did, well, actually entirely as a result of the webinar that we did and some of the feedback uh, during and since, um, I've started to read or reread some of the far-right critiques of higher education. Let's get into that. What um, do you think about, am I guessing correctly, did you read Chris Rufo? Uh, is he far-right? Yes, I, I, he's I not have, far right. I have, he's a... I have his... I have his most recent book. Well, tell us, tell us, tell us then. I, I, I really just want to focus this for the listener because I think this is a great point to get into. You've started as a result in part of our webinar series to investigate criticisms of theory that go beyond some of the things you might hear from your colleagues in academia, which tend to be in our realm of the humanities, almost exclusively left li uh, liberal, hardly any conservatives at all. Um, when you read Chris Rufo is to the right, uh, Claremont adjacent, Claremont Institute adjacent, and then somebody who's not to the right, but more in the center left, li liberal um, in the liberal camp. Um, so I don't know if you mean at all to um, allude to the uh, work of Yasha Monk, but who do you mean by the, these folks? The two, and and what do you take I... to be the substance, the correctness or incorrectness of those who say that at the end of the day, critical theory, postmodern theory has created an environment where the kids are anti-intellectual, um, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, anti-capitalism, anti-Western civilization, maybe even anti-civilization. We don't know how many genders they've got. We don't know anything about these people anymore who seem to have become nihilists and relativists. And who have you been reading? And how do you respond to a great deal of criticism out there in the public sphere today of theory as something that's contributed to the crisis of the university and and you know including is israel's uh, uncomfortable position in in this regard the the two people i've been reading um uh, are chris rufo and john ellis and oh i know them both ellis i had read some of literally decades ago <clears throat> decided that he was a lunatic and stopped reading him um and john was my teacher by the way and i talked to him just yesterday he's a dear oh, really? friend and my old teacher uh from graduate school days one of the greatest mentors i've ever ever had so go on but tread lightly uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> 
actually say what you have not, to say. Say what you have I to have, say. I haven't looked at the book he did 30 years ago called Against Deconstruction, uh, but I've ordered a copy of it because I think that's, I haven't read it. Um, interesting book. Uh, that's one that I one that I will need to confront. You know, in the in his most recent book, which is the one I looked at, which um, is called the Breakdown of Higher Education. That's right, the title, the, the Breakdown of with Higher with Education, a fragmented, uh, with a fragmented statue on the cover, and then yeah, the more or less nice advocating for the pulling the plug on American universities, defunding the thought police. I mean, to put it a little bluntly, he's very sour on the universities. He think they can only be thinks they can only be changed from outside pressure and so on. I mean, it's it's quite a strong view. What do you say about it? Well, first of all, I, I do believe that outside pressure needs to be part of the story at this point. I don't think I, I'm not confident that universities can heal themselves, just as I say in the book repeatedly that I that I no longer in the new book that I no longer believe academic disciplines can heal themselves. That was an AEUP position for a long time, and I accepted it and believed it, but, you know, it ain't going to happen in my lifetime. I've kind of, I'm I'm afraid I just don't, not confident in it anymore. Why I, is that? Why can't uh, thoughtful people uh, correct course in this instance? Well, it, it I think it begins with, they're being encouraged to take positions on subjects about which they don't know anything. I mean, the, uh, when they focus on their areas of actual responsibility, where there hopefully is some tradition of debate and 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 welcoming of a variety of opinions, but when from the get-go, their first step into some new area is a step of um, of brainwashed conviction, then they're not going to fix that. Then you know they're not going to they're not going to they're not going to challenge themselves. So you know, women and gender studies becomes expert on Israel because it wants to be, because it thinks that that's the cool thing, that that's the moral imperative to be an expert on Israel and not to know anything about Israeli history and not to know anything about Jewish culture, and not to know anything about anything relevant to the subject, but you have conviction. So what motivates once they, that? Once, once, they, once the discipline is warped into areas in which it doesn't have a knowledge base, mm. what's going to lead it to correct itself? It won't correct itself. Now, so you recommend Jewish parents, uh, American citizens of good faith and uh, of uh, good heart and of stern stuff do what? Well, first of all, there have to be ways that donors to universities get to have some principled input about how their resources, about how their gifts are spent. Mm -hmm. And I don't have, you know, I there is supposedly work being done on on model contracts for donors mm -hmm. that would that would let you say. Uh, Donate many money to a Jewish studies program that guarantees that that faculty be hired that have uh, some belief that a Jewish state has a right to exist, quite separate from any criticism of that state, but that it has a right to exist. That that's that would be fundamental to how your resources will be spent. Conditions so, on the spending of funds, you think, are right. doable? Not to include not to include donor power over who gets appointed to a job, because that's an anathema, and I oppose it, and is often very destructive, because they can't judge academic work, typically. But there ought to be some, some limits, some guiding principles to how money is spent. And it universities get a free pass now, so people do, donate to a Jewish studies program, and discover that Omar Barghouti is the name chair who gets appointed with their money. I mean, that's anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. It's like American studies. They should call it anti-American studies. It's I mean, that's, how things roll. That, and people get outraged that, that the idea that donors should have any influence. But I think there has to be a way to have principal control. Um, and, and that, because, you know, we now have Jewish studies programs around the country that are basically anti-Zionist Jewish studies programs. 
That's been the case for the yeah. one here in Illinois, where I am. Yeah. It's the case at UCLA and a number of other campuses. And that th those are funded by people whose money is being used in a way that, um, that they're outraged by if they're still alive, or they're turning over in their graves at what the prospect is. It is. So that just, there, there has to be, there have to be pedagogical okay. resources on campus right. that, that are even-handed, at least that recognize the the aspirations of both Palestinians and Jews and try to recognize the, the struggle to achieve uh, equality of aspiration and equality of political realization for both peoples. That that's a that's a kind of a, a basic principle that campuses have to honor. And it partly depends upon how these resources, these donor resources. Mm -hmm. Any Jewish studies programs, the one here was when people wanted to start a Jewish studies program years ago, the campus said, if you can raise the money for it, okay, we're mm -hmm. not going to pay for it. You got to raise the money for it. So they were started with outside money. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the math department was started with state funding, but Jewish studies had to be started by donors. It was donor dependent. And I think uh, it has to be politically equitable uh, in how it proceeds. Well, so how are we going to get politically equitable get viewpoint diversity in a system with nine out of 10 faculty, liberal left, radical left, Marxist, and beyond, nine out of 10 on the campuses? And in our field of the humanities, it's almost a rounding error that you'd meet a conservative, let alone a Republican voter. But that's not true of the you know, American people at large. So simply put... John Ellis presses on this point quite a bit. He says that, um, what is it? Uh, personnel is policy. What do you think of that? Well, I'm, in terms of my university tasks, setting aside teaching, what was the most valuable inspiring work that I did as a faculty member other than teaching and research. There's no question in my mind what that is. The it's, book we did together, you and I, the, the case against academic boycotts of Israel. But second, but second to that. Uh, no, setting aside publication, uh, setting aside teaching, what's the most valuable and inspiring work that I did? Hiring faculty members. Uh, yes. I refused to serve on a curriculum committee. I refused to come in for meetings about where the new Xerox machine was going to be placed in the English building. <laughs> um, I would make, I would help make hiring decisions and tenure decisions. And I chaired numerous hiring committees and we worked relentlessly. We would, once we got to the finalists, Everyone read, if it was a new person, everyone read the dissertation. Mm. We debated the quality of the dissertation for hours in mm. meeting after meeting. We worked out a series of very elaborate questions to ask the candidate. Mm. And we tried it to make a judgment about their intellectual life. And and look what's happened. <laughs> and and uh we only, with one exception, we only made good hires. Oh, you did? Okay. We hired. We hired Are any ones. of them speaking to you at this point? Um, <laughs> I kid. I kid. Well, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, then explain I, that. I mean, I, I love still, what you're I saying. Still, I still admire them, but uh, we're not chatting any longer. So this uh, is interesting because what you say is is very, very important. You took care with this. It's important you took enormous care with this. And still, on the Israel issue, if I catch you correctly, all this care somehow wasn't quite enough, or what? Well, of course, we didn't question people about their politics. So um, I was chair of the committee that hired Michael Rothberg here as a faculty member. Mazel tov. <laughs> um, 
At that point, it was his dissertation. The dissertation argues that comparisons between the Holocaust and other events of mass ethnic religious violence are necessary and they are enlightening that went against the grain of the, of the you cannot compare the Holocaust to anything. Mm -hmm. First of all, a semiotic complaint with the, with the, with, with the other position, which was that um, the only way we have meaning is by similarities and differences. I hear you. You can't come to a concept of the Holocaust in isolation from the history of planet Earth. You can't do it. That comparative process is necessary. And in my view, when you compare, the distinctiveness of the Holocaust is highlighted. It becomes more strange mm -hmm. and more awful the more you compare it to other things. That mixture of organized, industrialized violence with occasions for intimate, pathological, individually decided violence you see it again in 107 that's that same that's that same horrific mixture i think for that and many other reasons the comparisons so make the holocaust more powerful not and less and you chose a candidate for a bold stance at that point because you right. know and you're suggesting and everyone knows that that was a a bold stance he took and you appreciated that you hired him and and we were friends yeah. and uh we socialized and spent time together and then Israel began to be more of a debated topic on campus. I had a couple of conversations with Michael about it. He made it clear that he was that he hadn't anticipated that I would be where st that I would stand where I was standing. Hmm. Hmm. He was said he was immensely disappointed in me. Hmm. I never raised my voice with him. Hmm. Um, and at some point, he said, "I won't talk to you about Israel anymore." He said, the only, the only Israel that I can tolerate is one that has no connection with Judaism. Hmm. And this is the Holocaust scholar. And of course, we have Omar Bartov. We have other Holocaust scholars who are a problem. There are, there are a significant number who have a problem. And um, then in the, in, in the weirdest development, when the university turned down the appointment for Stephen Salaita, um, I was the key faculty member speaking out to support the university's decision. Salaita's key defender on campus was Michael Rothberg, who was mm. who then by then had become head of the English department. Mm. So I was in a debate with the head of with my department head over the Salida point. What did Salida do to generate this controversy? For those of our listeners who are um, too young to remember, uh, you 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 spoke up against this this guy uh, getting a job, or, or 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 however you might like to to put it. He hadn't yet been hired. He wasn't being fired. But you you were opposed. Rothberg was pro. Um, geez, even. I've got some family members who are on the Salida side. Myself, I wasn't too um, sympathetic to Salida, um, but um, I don't well, know. Well, it was, it was what, I mean, what, what, what was that like? And what was, what did he say and what did he do? He and, was, and then he yeah. was the initial, the, the contract was sent to him in 2014. He signed the board of trustees learned about his social media presence, his tweets, which were uh, fine. They were well sample, within the bounds sample, of reasonable civil discourse. Am I wrong? Sample, sample tweet. Um, if not Netanyahu were to appear on Israeli TV wearing a necklace made out of the bones of Palestinian children, would anyone really be surprised? So the Board of Trustees didn't feel this was, this was thoughtful. Uh, they thought it was anti-Semitic. And they refused to sign his contract. And the, he's, I think he also tweeted, correct me if I'm wrong, and, um, I'm sorry, Zionism, tur turning anti-Semitism from something um, terrible to something uh, admirable. I'm paraphrasing. Right. That was another That was another tweet. So my position was, 
that they had done the right thing in refusing to sign the contract, but that they had done it for the wrong reasons. Ah. First of all, he'd been tweeting for a couple of years. There were a huge quantity of tweets. The only, the only tweets under consideration here were the ones from the summer of 2014, spring and summer of 2014, uh, during the war with Hamas. So his social media presence should have been studied thoroughly, not just, you know, not just, you know, a few dozen tweets from that period of time. But more seriously than that, his publications had not been thoroughly enough vetted. Uh, it's a little bit like Claudine Gay in a way then. I mean, like there's this outstanding public kind of issue, but then you look at their work and in her case, it's not very good. And would you say well, the same not about- a, there's, not, there's not a hell of a lot of it on her case either. Right, right. and in Salida's case, a, yeah, no, she didn't have much. I mean, she among, among the things the Native American Studies Program did not discuss his book, Israel's Dead Soul. They didn't Israel's talk dead soul. Israel's dead soul. They did not. They didn't discuss any of his anti-Zionist stuff. Now, um, I had a confidant in the American Studies program. Uh, one of their senior people, um, very dis very distinguished, accomplished writer, was opposed to the Salida appointment in the Native American Studies, mm. Program. Mm. and the program became so toxic for her. Joy Harjo, as a result. Oh, she's a big she name, had, yeah. She had to change departments. She, she asked the university to take her out of Native American studies. She's an American Indian. She had to get out of the program. What well, does she know about her, Native American studies compared to right, um, a Palestinian exactly. American? She had to change. And I had, I, she wasn't my source, but I had another source uh, who was opposed to the appointment but didn't speak up because he or she understood where the reality was. But so I had someone inside the program talking to me about was it. Was he qualified in Native American then or not? Salida, not from my perspective. And the key, the key argument in his, the, the key argument that they liked and which he made, which he made the, the inspired uh, discovery of his dissertation, which also became a book, Years earlier, Ben Gurion had, you know, made a, a visit to the United States to New York, and you know, alluded to American history and Native Americans, and so Salida decided that the entire inspiration for the uh, purported Israeli abuse of Palestinians was the abuse of Native Americans on the American continent. Well, everybody knows that uh, eighty percent of Palestinians died of um, diseases that they had no resistance to when the um, Jewish refugees from Europe returned to their indigenous land. That, so the comp comparison is quite proper. I felt he couldn't that he couldn't evaluate evidence that he didn't know the difference between evidence and supposition. Um, I felt his his stuff was second rate, and. You know, yeah, I've read it. I have to agree. I had, I had a history of turning people down for tenure. He or several people. I've worked to see that they didn't get tenure, even though they published books, because I thought the books weren't any good. And this had nothing to do with Israel. I was, you know, I was not a kind reviewer of applications. Well, this is for well, you're beloved or, by all to this day. Um, your role as a gatekeeper uh, in our profession is uh, universally admired, you were saying. So uh, <laughs> I just felt that um, Soleil wasn't up to the standards of Illinois. Now, of course, he's, you know, we have him supporting 10-7. Um, oh, so tell me about that. I, I God knows how I missed that since um, Shabbat Shachor uh, in Israel. Was, we, we, we haven't had a chance to focus a, on Salida, but what, what was he? Someone sent me a blog he? post by him supporting 10-7. Um, I'd have to recover supporting it. Supporting it, my God. But I mean, then again, people have done that across uh, the American campus. Um, I would love to dig into this topic more and more and more, and I could talk to you uh, endlessly. We only have so much time, so don't let me cut you 
short here, but I I'd like to. This was supposed to be four hours. What happened? Well, it it feels <laughs> like it. Um, has it been? <laughs> um, can I want to shift over to your important sure. new book? I think a game changer on the free speech debates. I think it's going to be um, a, a bestseller and have a huge impact. You've got a new book out. Well, on let me say speech. quickly about about. Um, yeah, uh, let's wrap up on the other. Ellis, and Ellis, Ellis. They, yeah, yeah. they tend, they condemn higher education to the court. I mean, the whole yeah. enterprise is, is yes. a disaster. Ellis and... and, and uh... we, all, we all know faculty members all across the world who, did, who do good, good work, who do good teaching, who are capable of thinking. But and schools they, are they teaching don't, students to hate their to country. Uh, to put it, just to, just to throw in for the other side. Students learn to hate their country more than anything else at universities, and it's too much. I think that that isn't true. I think that students, they, they learn to hate certain things. Some students, many students, learn to hate certain things. Do I think that they're right, that, um, that anti-Americanism is definitional for a generation of students? I think that's a fantasy that it felt much. It, I thought that was much more the case during the Vietnam War than it is now. Um, it was, I think, for a time case during the Iraq War. But I don't I don't feel that that the passionate anti-Americanism that they claim is definitional actually is for the current generation of students. Hmm. I think it's I think it's a it's a distorted fantasy on their part. Um, so when Chris Rufo you know, on the right and uh, uh, Yasha Monk on the left, two important new books out, say in so many words, because we only got so much time, that Herbert I, Marcuse. I read Yasha Monk, so, you know, I guess I'll know, have they're, to. They're not so far apart, these guys on the left and the right here, these two uh, guys, uh, and there's more out there. James Livingston has a book out, maybe a little more to the right even. But when, when let's say, Rufo and, and, and Monk overlap on, just uh, put a little crudely here for the sake of time, that, that people like Herbert Marcuse, the teacher of Angela Davis, the teacher of Black Lives Matter that leads to Kimberly Crenshaw and others, have, I put it to you, um, for your view on this, have created a, an intellectual environment that is nihilistic and destructive and i thought kimberly crenshaw's initial work on intersectionality was useful and insightful now once again it's been it's been weaponized in a in a particular way that i think is hostile and and brainwashing and dreadful but i don't think i don't think it was destined mm. well maybe it was destined Become it's not inherent. Happens. It's not inherent to the arguments, is what you're saying. Right. From yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so back back to my book. Yes, no, that's the perfect transition to your latest book. Tell us once again the title: uh, "Hate Speech and Academic Freedom: The Anti-Semitic Assault on Basic Principles." I it should just... be, be available in April. Okay, just in case anyone. Uh dozed off now here in, in the interim. What is this book about? What is the argument? What prompted it? Um, I've read a good portion of it and been very impressed. And um, I look forward to hearing uh, the conversations that it provokes. But why did you write it? What does it say? What's your book about? What what what, um, what are you saying and why? Well, I mean, I, I spent, I was in the elected AUP leadership for 20 years. Um, long time. Um, I issued more policy statements during the six years that I was AUP president than any AUP president had issued in the previous 50 years. Um, I was so I was writing constantly about academic freedom. And I began to see academic freedom distorted, misapplied. Um, and I wanted to ask myself a basic question. Are there limits to academic freedom? Are there, are there ways of, are, do we have a responsibility to deal with reprehensible faculty speech? Or is reprehensible faculty speech to be not only tolerated, but welcomed? 
Um, Nicely and, put. That uh, clar that's a clarifying question. What's the answer? So I, I tried to find ways in which we could exercise evaluative professional judgment while still preserving academic freedom. That's one of the challenges of the book. Mm. Um, and I struggled with it a lot. Um, I kept revising. Uh, the first two chapters I published versions of a couple years ago, mm. when I was working on them as a book, I decided I'd gotten a number of things wrong. <laughs> um, I decided I hadn't been I hadn't been as tough as I should be on social media and on the damage that faculty members could do on social media. So I read a lot more things. I talked to a lot more people. I participated in a lot more webinars and I totally revised the chapters. The chapter on social media is twice as long as, it, as the published version was a few years ago. I don't know if I got it right. I, I still, it's my best effort to get it right, to kind of work out a way in which universities could be responsible about their personnel, about their public image, and about the work that faculty members do without constraining free speech. Here, here's, a way of, here's a way of putting um, the danger that I think we're facing. Because repeatedly, anti-Zionist faculty members are now claiming that criticism of their work suppresses their academic freedom. Well, when the AEUP wrote its wonderful, famous 1915 declaration, which I've read many, many times, and which- You, you were know, one of the authors, am I wrong? Uh, well, I was, I was too old at that point to really work on the 1915 <laughs> statement, but you know, younger people were doing it. Um, it, it remains a just, it, it has a kind of eloquence that maybe nothing the organization has done since. Let's hear it. Equal. What does it say? And, and you know, it, it um, well, let's see. Let me think about how best, how best to do this. It, it argues about faculty responsibility. Uh, it argues that faculty members should be responsible and reasonable in their speech. It, it wants both to defend academic freedom, but say that there's that there are expectations of honor and dedication mm -hmm. to the search for the truth, without which the university has no raison d'etre. Okay, so if a faculty member comes up for tenure and they don't marshal evidence in support of their arguments, that they seem to be really pursuing not the truth, but a false political set of convictions, the university should be capable of making a judgment about that, about mm. the quality of the work. I mean, it, it, that's what academic freedom is about. It's about yeah. conducting debates in pursuit of the truth. But I think what we're going to, if unless it's already happened, maybe it's already, probably has already happened, but I think we're going to see a general trend amongst anti-Zionist candidates for tenure and their supporters that critical evaluation of their publications suppresses their academic freedom. So your so book I'm, helps to counter that? I document? hope so. How? I hope it's- How? Hope tell tell the audience uh, what what- they can use your book to do when people say that and they want to respond. Well, I think you have to do proper professional evaluation. When Salida was a point was uh, provisionally given a contract here, no one had done a thorough analysis of his publications. They want to give them a job and they haven't discussed them. They haven't they haven't written thorough evaluations of them. They 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 like what he was saying. What the hell give him a job? That's not how you do it. Um, so I think there are part of what the book really wants to do is say there are decision points in a faculty member's career when he or she should be subject to tough professional judgments. 
the first is when you hire somebody mm -hmm. for god's sake do it do a thorough job interview them in detail because you're trying to make a, a judgment about quality you're trying to make a, a prediction about what someone is going to do with their professional lives over a number of years and those predictions are hard to make because we all know that some people don't realize their capacities some people have their moment and then they don't can't repeat it so it's hard to make those judgments but that's the job especially I mean this is a research institution you you're supposed to be asking what contributions are someone going to make toward the field you're supposed to be asking what contributions are they going to be making to the image of the institution what contributions are they going to make to the community so if the con I mean if the contribution someone's up for tenure and they have gone on about how wonderful Hamas was in trying to liberate itself mm -hmm. and liberate the Palestinian people by butchering Jews and foreign visitors on October 7th maybe that's not someone who's going to make a future wonderful contribution to their your campus so they're up for tenure maybe the answer should be no when you put everything in context especially when they're teaching their publication their public statements are in sync when there's a co when there's a coherence and a persistence of perspectives like that maybe that's someone that you have to vote no on it's or not a maybe... threat to free speech to evaluate somebody's speech and their work and their statements it's not a threat to them making statements that you would evaluate their uh output when you decide whether you want to endorse them you know doing the important job of being a university teacher yeah I mean that's exactly it now do I want do I want a kind of um kangaroo court making those kind of decisions about faculty speech day in and day out no uh I, but there there are moments in a career when that kind of oversight is necessary it's expected at those moments in a career and at other times there are other decisions that could be made I mean if someone to turn in a sabbatical application for what is obviously a pathological research project maybe you say no um yeah if only um, I, I you you're talking to a fellow academic I've seen some proposals for sabbaticals that are pretty <laughs> much out there uh nobody says no but uh you think it doesn't have to be that way you no, there aren't be. that isn't a fatal decision right I mean it's not you haven't thrown someone out in the street but it's a if you, it's a you start should you should do a professional evaluation of a sabbatical application at my institution they're 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 pretty much automatic really I mean very rarely is there ever anyone actually taking a serious look at a sabbatical application but mm -hmm. why not I mean why turn in the application if it's if it's just a, if it's all a rote process um so I think there are other mm -hmm. other there, there are other times when professional judgments are appropriate someone puts them forward for status or recognition they're they're asking to be evaluated they should be evaluated but the but I don't believe in I believe a tenured faculty member should be exercising protected speech but again there are decisions that can be made um John Ellis Sorry to threaten. No, no, let's hear it. No, he's written think, an important think, book. It's think, got a lot think, of positive response, but you say what? Th he thinks Amy Wax is a brilliant hero of, of the profession. Yes. And he, misrep he misrepresents why she was removed. She was teaching a required course for first year law students. And she publicly said that she's never had any black law students who were equal to the quality of her white law students, that the black law students were all of inferior quality. The black Is that law a students, quote or a close the, paraphrase? I'm sorry. I a just... close paraphrase, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. The black law students felt, I don't want to sit in that class, in a required class, and be judged by her. Mm. And I think, I think they were fair in thinking, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be judged objectively. I'm not going to get disinterested professional judgment. So what the, the dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, he didn't threaten her tenure. 
He didn't fire her. He he said she can't teach the required course anymore. That was the sanction. Mm. You know, she can teach other things. She can teach electives. Not but the end of the world. Her, yeah. She can't mm -hmm. teach her a course in which black students have to sit and be judged by her once she takes that position. Now, of course, she went on after that to say that that um, that the United States was letting too many Asians into the country uh, to be citizens, and we needed to reduce uh, the number the number of Asians that are that are uh, admitted to the country. I mean, these just this is not intellectual courage. And Ellis doesn't deal directly with what the basis was for taking her out of that required course. Mm -hmm. I was I was at a I was at an event some years ago. Uh, back east in Washington, where she and I both spoke, and she said her academic freedom had been violated by the decision. I, this is Amy Wax, and I got up and said, absolutely not. I think mm -hmm. it was the right decision. I didn't think she should be, you know, pilloried in the center of uh, the center of the campus, but I thought she shouldn't. Black students shouldn't have to take what, a course from what, someone who what, felt they were they were likely to be highly inferior. You so, make a good case. What? However, is free speech for, which is a broader concept, or more, more narrowly, academic freedom for, some people say, except for the tough cases. That's to say, it's easy for me to defend your academic freedom. You're a responsible guy. You say some weird stuff occasionally, uh, get a few drinks in you, who knows? But you're, you know, you're easy to support and to defend. You've done credible work. Isn't academic freedom, free speech, et cetera, for the tough cases isn't it for even those speech acts that we don't like like the nazis in skokie and so on i mean i hear what you're saying about this case i haven't studied it deeply but how do you respond to that notion that if we can't sort of defend the i don't want to say outliers but tough cases what is it for well that's why i say amy wax shouldn't be fired she gets to say her stuff she gets to keep her job. She gets to teach courses that students can choose to take or not take. She gets to be a well-paid law professor at, you know, a modestly decent school, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she gets all these privileges, but she doesn't get to hold black students under her thumb. You are nuanced. You are nothing if not nuanced. Your whole book, uh, your new book, what was the title again? It is so nuanced. I, I mean, I, I mean this. You, you read it, and it's, it's this point, that point, a shade of gray here, a shade to the other side there. It's so carefully done that it's almost mind numbing. I, I, I think I, <laughs> I, struggled, I struggled with these issues. Yeah, I mean, it's not easy to try to mark the limits of academic freedom um, yeah. because, because the absolutist version is perfectly simple and attractive, yeah. um, but there are problems with it. And um, I think if the search for the truth is what we're about, and if academic freedom involves critique and analysis of strengths and weaknesses, then the professional decisions that are based upon that process need to be thorough and responsible. And and as I said about the hiring, when you really do that kind of thorough work, it's exhilarating because it's the it's the most mm. intimate intellectual work that you will do with colleagues. Putting that kind of effort into a hiring and a tenure decision, it's the most intellectually challenging work because there are people's careers at stake. And um it it helps make you what you are as a faculty member. If you if you slough it off, if you, I mean, yeah. uh, it's gone. When, it's when, over. Uh, yeah. I had I had a good friend, quite good friend of many years during the Salida stuff at Illinois, hmm. uh, who stood up at a faculty member faculty meeting and said, given the horror of American treatment of Native Americans. It was inappropriate to try to judge the work of of a scholar in Native American studies. They shouldn't be shouldn't be evaluated 
Really? That's that's amazing. That's outrageous. My God. I mean, you could say the opposite. You could say the opposite much more appropriately, given the horror of the Native American treatment. We need the best people on this topic. Well, you know, I have been in favor of affirmative action hiring from my first days here. We've done a lot of affirmative action hiring, spe had special opportunities for hiring uh, minorities, and we've consistently hired great people that way. I mean, you we can had do done, both. You can do done both. damn good opportunity hiring of minorities. Quality people. and diversity don't have to be in conflict. And it was a, it was great that the university had special funds that you could go out and pursue really good minority candidate. And um, you know, well, that's terrific. The let only me, mistakes. Let me... The only mistakes my department made in were the thirty-six who? years. Name, I name names. There, yeah, we're, we're over. We're over white people, not minority. Ah, interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had an old teacher back in the. Uh, we never day. made well. There, there was one bad minority hire made, but that was years ago. It was made back in the nineteen sixties in my department. I, you know, I wasn't here. That was the one substandard minority hire but from, mm. from all the all the appointments we did over over you know, three and a half decades were really terrific people um and there it is you know and it was partly my partly affirmative action hiring we there were special funds if, if you identify someone you can go after them um and you can give them give them a, a bit of extra money to try to bring them to the middle of Illinois. As you know, when you're in an isolated place, um, uh, it can be <laughs> it can be a little harder to get someone to move there. So we, the university put resources behind it and, uh, and, and it worked, at least in my department, it worked. Well, that's eloquently stated. And, and I, I have a question for you coming at this from a, another angle. Maybe I'll just say in passing what I, thought to say a moment ago, I had a, a teacher years ago when I was but a grad student myself who used to like to tell an anecdote. He would say he was walking across campus with a, a friend of his who was African-American, and the guy said to him, um, this teacher happened to be uh, Caucasian, where where are the black folks? And, uh, um, and he said, well, you know, we haven't been able to find, you know, the very, very best uh, qualified people who happen to be black. And the the black guy said, "No, no, no, no. I'm, I'm looking around. I'm seeing a lot of mediocre white folks. Where are the mediocre black folks? <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, not that we should aim for mediocrity, but that um, excellence comes in all shapes and sizes and colors. I suppose, if I can put it that way. Carrie, you um, have now talked about taking care to uh, evaluate the work." of scholars um however outspoken they may be uh however controversial and reaching a nuanced kind of judgment you gave the example of amy wax um i guess we could say on the on the right there uh what about a different case but in some ways perhaps similar in your new book you devote a chapter to uh, of all things, an issue of a journal called Israel Studies. Am I getting that right? Israel Studies. Uh, the issue was called Word Crimes. Right. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. I, uh, to be honest, happened to be a contributor along with about 12 other people to that uh, issue of the journal. And there, we, uh, that issue got judged uh picked over critiqued uh, you know you're you're an advocate of 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 not curtailing free speech but but not giving um people's expression a free pass we should have the right to say what we think to write what we, we we think and and yet um to receive criticism so in the case of that journal issue it was um criticized uh from, can we say the left, from the anti-Zionist left in the Israel studies field, what happened to just to take another case now from say Amy Wax or others like that, there's so many like that uh, similar to 
to her um, law professors and classicists who've been canceled and, and so on for you know dubious reasons, but we can't count them all. Now, this this was a uh, journal. She wasn't this canceled. Was... I mean, she wasn't canceled. No, she no, was no. But, different yeah, teaching okay. time. yeah, no, but yeah, pe okay, people taking flack. Let's take another example, because it's one that you spend a chapter on in your book. What happened with word crimes, the Israel Studies um, issue of the Israel Studies uh, Journal? It got a, a lot of criticism. It was controversial. Why don't you tell the story? Well, I mean, um, Israel Studies became the uh, object of an anti-intellectual moral panic. Um, academic freedom entails debate. You're supposed to take debate the arguments that people make. You're supposed to debate the evidence that they present in support of those arguments. The attacks on uh, the issue of Israel studies, the word crimes issues, issue, none of it was based on disagreeing with the arguments that people were making. Astonishing. Faculty members instead said uh, the issue was an abomination. Uh, its editors should be fired. Um, the, you know they wanted uh, they wanted punishments. Uh, they wanted the rack. They wanted an Iron Maiden. Uh, you know they wanted all all the instruments of medieval torture to be applied, and they didn't engage with any arguments. I, I thought there were lots of really useful arguments in that issue. I still think so. I'm you know I've reread the thing more than once. Um, I think it should be a touchstone for the way in which language can function to, say, to shape political perspectives, political decisions. It, it should be a, it's a kind of a watershed issue. I think mm. it was really valuable. Um, it should be read and reread. I agree with you. Um, and it should be added to, right? I mean, one complaint is that, you know, one issue wasn't enough. There should be three more. It'd be great. The should continue in a in a serious way. Yeah. So instead um, of engaging with the word crimes, it has a you know recent issue essay that um, in in mosaic that that takes up additional vocabulary mm. and pursues the project further. So so I think people will will do that. Um, uh, it was a shameful example of faculty members. Uh, not behaving as faculty members, uh, not they wanted to not, withdraw the. They they said not here are arguments we gonna we're gonna publish our uh, arguments. They said retract the issue. Was that what it was? It was like a very much a kind of thing of the moment where people were calling for cancellation retraction instead of the old school. Let's debate it. Am I right? They wanted to, they wanted to bring all the issues to the center of Berlin and burn them. Um, I mean, you know, well, they wanted, that, that they wanted another thing. Nazi What motivated that, uh, do you think? What? What, 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 why was, what, what motivated such a reaction instead of arguing, which is what we do in our profession? Well, it, it was people who were consumed by their anti-Zionist biases to be unable to deal with the possibility that the, the rhetoric they had been using and the vocabulary to which they had become addicted were in fact distorted examples of unsupported or thoroughly mistaken uh, and biased argumentation. There were people who, who couldn't deal with the fact that that issue implicitly put their own work under scrutiny. Mm. There, there were, were chapters on any number of things from Israel lobby to human rights to Holocaust inversion to apartheid terrorism. These are some of the chapter titles, right? Occupation, yeah. colonialism. All these terms were taken up and, and looked at and, 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 and um, considered for ways in which they might have become biased uh, in some ways used for anti-Zionist purposes. And so they came in for scrutiny, Islamophobia. Pinkwashing. There was even one 
uh, on indigeneity and another couple more. There was one on Zionism and one on intersectionality, I believe. Now, most of these essays- I, were, I don't know who wrote on intersectionality. Well, I can't remember who that was. Let's leave personalities and names out, out of it. Um, right. You've read and you've reread um, this issue. And I know that because I read your original response to it in Fathom when it came out. And I've now had the chance to read your updated thoughts in your new book. I appreciated that your thoughts have evolved. Um, most of these essays that I listed came in for um, a positive appraisal for you pr pretty thoroughly. The Zionism one you weren't so sure about and the intersectionality essay uh, as well. But this is my question uh, to you on the second um of those in Fathom, you deemed that one to have some very good points, to be rather brilliant in a lot of ways, um, much better than any work you yourself ever could have done in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I'm exaggerating slightly in, 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 now here, but-, no, that's, but... <laughs> that's a, you, you, have, you have a right to some, some local color, I think. <laughs> All right, but, but, and to be serious, you thought that with its virtues acknowledged that it, it uh, should be criticized at that time, you said, for uh, adopting the voice of the aggrieved white male. In your current book chapter, I was astonished. You changed your position on this almost completely. You said it verged on the voice of the aggrieved white male. In the first instance, you said that it was that. And now you say that it's not, because verging on it means it's you know, it's 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 not that. It might have approached that. It's a very serious question. After 10-7 or 7-10, as we, we say in um, the Jewish state, we do the calendar thing a little differently. Um, some people were saying that, gee, anyone who was out front on criticizing intersectionality as it's been actually practiced, let's leave aside for the moment because time is limited, it's true meaning and its best uses. But People were saying that guy, those people who dared to criticize intersectional feminism when it wasn't popular, you could take a lot of flack for it, after 710 when, um, or 107, Jewish Israeli women have been abandoned by contemporary feminism, intersectionalist feminism, not all feminism, but feminism as it uh, is practiced today in the fourth wave. The people who dared to take the flack to criticize intersectionality early on when it wasn't popular should be applauded. They were prophetic. You yourself in the book acknowledge that um, such people might have verged on sounding aggrieved, but um, had a lot of good points. In, in in your original assessment, you 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 were more critical. What convinced you that such people were um, right after all in the in the full scheme of things? Well, I mean, I think. In the in the talk that I gave for the for the Tilo series, I was once again engaged with the presence and the legacy of <clears throat> of feminist theory and feminism, and um, my <clears throat> my problem with the with the intersectionality essay and with uh, you know some critiques from the right is throwing out feminism entirely or trying to claim that it's 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 primary intellectual force has now been destructive and i i remain very much dedicated um to a lot of the work in feminist theory that was done in the 70s and 80s well even before the 70s of course some of it i thought at the time was was no good uh, some I thought was second rate. Um, some of it I thought was crazy. Uh, some of it I thought was hilarious. So mistaken as to be comic. Um, I mean, it, it, it covered a whole spectrum. And, uh, you know, I linked the, the decision in the talk by the Brandeis Women's Studies Program to, to force the cancellation of Ian Hersey Ali's mm -hmm. honorary degree at Brandeis to the despicable uh, 
denial by American fem and some European feminists of the psychotic, horrific, uh, misogynist violence of the Hamas terrorists on October 7. That, mm -hmm. that denial seemed to me in a kind of tradition now. You know, the Brandeis event had been a kind of signpost for me, a warning. Uh, the, the partial feminist response to 10-7 was a, um, obviously much more terrible version of it. Um, so I think that the, the dangers of being a supposed feminist who betrays the very theoretical and humane foundations of your discipline and your intellectual project, um, those dangers are real. We've seen them played out, but they don't betray, they, they don't apply to every feminist who's working. They don't, they don't apply to my wife <laughs> who has several feminist books to her credit. Um, and, um, you know, who's a Zionist. Um, well, I think every Zionist today has to be a Zionist feminist after 710 and 107 and the horrors of violence against women. Is there anything uh, that we left out that you'd like to say as we conclude this beautiful conversation? Carrie, anything left unsaid? Just that we have to grapple with these increasingly uncomfortable issues and we have to try to restore uh, the commitment to rigorous teaching, rigorous research, and the rigorous evaluation of all of those things at the university. And we have to confront the realities of anti-Semitism in the contemporary world and on our campuses. And we need to do many things in response. I remain convinced that the first thing to do for every campus is to adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Ah, we I, didn't talk I, about that. I, I opened the book in the and I put these things in the introduction because I wanted the rest of the book to be seen in that context. I have two policy statements. One is a, a, a policy statement that the universities, colleges and universities can use in adopting IRA that specifies what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. And if you adopt that policy statement, then all of the garbage that people have said about IRA goes out the window because those risks are then precluded. Uh, those the campuses can't misuse IRA that way. Mm, so I, yeah, that was a beautiful part of your book. You you really focused the I, use of IRA. How you could adopt it. And that's that's my AAUP training and working on policy statement after policy statement. Right. I mean, with a lot of lawyers uh, in the in the vicinity telling me what I could and couldn't say. We had we had we had, you know, back in the day, we had some of the most distinguished lawyers in the country serving on well, on the AUP's committee. A. And then in 2000 and uh, when, when, when I went out as president, they let all the law, they let all the distinguished lawyers go. They threw them all off the committee. Oh, my God. Um, and I have another policy statement on uh, opposition to academic departments taking controversial political stands, which tries to defend the rights of faculty members and voluntary faculty groups and staff and students to take those to stands, but not to take them in the name of the university, which is, of course, what has been happening since 2021 and that war with Hamas. Uh, where the academic departments have been taking anti-Zionist positions and imposing them on their students, faculty, and staff. And of course, it's gotten worse since 107. And there, there are more nasty statements up there. Again, a policy statement that institutions can adopt to prohibit that. Everybody gets to keep their academic freedom, but not administrative uh, entities, administrative units within colleges and universities, um, which, which can't represent the, the institution in those terms. 
Beautiful. So a chapter on word crimes, a chapter on the IRA definition, I-H-R-A, International Holocaust Remembrance, Remembrance Alliance. Alliance. Um, very much discussed, and, and I think your discussion of it is the most refined and careful and useful that I've seen in a lot of debates about this. So people are going to want to read that. It's the, certainly detailed anyway. <laughs> it, no one has ever <laughs> accused you of... Um, of uh, being overly concise or um, lacking detail, <laughs> uh, let's say, but 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 it's um it's all very pertinent. It's 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 not that it's somehow verbose uh, for its own sake. Well, we need the we need the IRA definition more mm -hmm. now even than we did a few months ago. And your chapter, I think, because I watch this stuff, I follow this stuff, is the most sophisticated treatment of that topic. People interested in IRA have got to read your book got to read that chapter people interested in departments taking political um stands particularly with the way women's studies has come out um as you note very strongly anti-zionist of late and and that's created problems at least certain certain organizations not to tar and feather the whole field have got something to read there in um uh, a chapter uh including the that. program here at illinois which is you know right in the forefront with the women's and gender studies program here and promoting uh hatred of israel it's you know right in my own backyard well i hope you'll come back on to the uh helos paul picone israel initiative podcast maybe some months from now in the future when uh your book has been um hailed and um attacked from all sides and defended from all sides and i'm sure you'll be doing a lot of other media appearances as this um conversation continues and um as debates about cultural it's great, studies it's great. it's great to talk with you go on uh, yeah other people are going to be lucky to be able to do this um open-ended conversation um it's it, it's <laughs> it's what life is about for their support of the telos paul picona institute's israel initiative we wish to thank the families of nancy and paul oberman and lynn and rabbi samuel stahl who continue the commitments of Lois and Willard Cahotis in support of Holocaust education. Lois and Willard Cahotis dedicated their lives to enhancing respect for humans of all faiths and beliefs, while creating space for understanding and acceptance of the differences and the similarities inherent among peoples.